In this video, we'll define diagonal matrices, see examples and non-examples, and look at how easy basic matrix calculations can be with diagonal matrices. We say that a square matrix is diagonal if all entries off the main diagonal are zero. Note this definition says nothing about the entries on the main diagonal. It just must be the case that any entry not on the main diagonal is zero. This is a very nice class of matrices. Here are a few examples. This is a diagonal two by two matrix. You can see there are some entries on the main diagonal, but everything not on the main diagonal is zero. The identity matrix, of course, is a diagonal matrix. We have ones across the diagonal, but importantly, everything not on the main diagonal is zero. This matrix has some zeros on the diagonal, this one here. That doesn't really matter, though, because everything not on the diagonal is zero. That's what makes it a diagonal matrix. Everything not on the diagonal is zero. Going further, this matrix here is all zeros, but it does fit the definition of a diagonal matrix because everything not on the diagonal is zero. Whatever is on the diagonal doesn't matter. It's a diagonal matrix because what's not on the diagonal is zero. In each of these matrices, if we take any of the entries that aren't on the diagonal and change them so that they are no longer equal to zero, then we would no longer have a diagonal matrix. So those are non-examples. None of these are diagonal matrices anymore because they have non-zero entries off the main diagonal. Here, of course, is what a general n by n diagonal matrix would look like. It has diagonal entries d1, d2 through dn. And everywhere else, off that main diagonal, everywhere else we have zeros. Now one of the nice things about a diagonal matrix is that it's very easy to determine if a diagonal matrix is invertible or not. We already said that a matrix can have a zero on its diagonal and still be a diagonal matrix. But if a diagonal matrix has no zeros on its diagonal, then it's invertible. A diagonal matrix is invertible if and only if all of its diagonal entries are non-zero. And the inverse of such a diagonal matrix is very easy to find. If this is our n by n invertible diagonal matrix, then the inverse, d inverse, consists of just the reciprocals of those non-zero main diagonal entries that the original matrix d had. So of course it's zeros everywhere, not on the main diagonal, but on the main diagonal, just take the reciprocals of all those entries, and that is how you get the inverse of an invertible diagonal matrix. This makes it very clear why zero causes a problem, because we can't have a reciprocal of zero. But if you multiply these two matrices together, you can see how D1 will get hit by the 1 over D1, producing an entry of 1. D2 is going to get hit by 1 over D2, producing an entry of one, and so on. All the way down, we will just have ones along the diagonal, thus giving the identity matrix. Note, for example, when you multiply this matrix D by D inverse, if we have the second row and we're matching that up with the first column, everything's going to be zero because you're gonna have zero times one over D1, D2 times zero, plus everything else will be products of zero. It's only when we're calculating the diagonal entries of the resulting matrix, so the second row matched up with the second column, it's only then that we're going to get two non-zero entries that match up and multiply together, and that would be D2 times 1 over D2 in this case. And it works similarly for the rest of the computation, producing ones across the entire diagonal, of the product. Because of how simply matrix multiplication works with diagonal matrices, taking powers of diagonal matrices is really straightforward. The kth power of a diagonal matrix D is just the diagonal matrix consisting of the kth powers of D's diagonal entries. Let's see some examples. Here is a diagonal matrix A. Let's do some simple calculations. From our previous discussion, we can find A inverse very easily. 
It's just the diagonal matrix consisting of the reciprocals of the non-zero diagonal entries from the original matrix. So 2 turns into 1 half. Negative 1 turns into negative 1. 4 turns into 1 over 4. Just the reciprocals. That's how you get A inverse. Now what about A to the power of 4? Well, we just have to take the diagonal entries from A and raise them to the power of 4. So we would have 2 to the power of 4, which is 16, negative 1 to the power of 4, which is positive 1, and 4 to the power of 4, which is 16 times 16, or 256. Then what about a to the negative 4? Well, we could just take a to the 4, which is a diagonal matrix, and find its inverse, which is just the reciprocals of the diagonal entries of a to the 4. So 1 over 16, 1, and 1 over 256. You can see how easy it is to do some simple calculations with diagonal matrices. In these examples, the only matrices at play are diagonal matrices, but multiplying a diagonal matrix by a non-diagonal matrix is also a very straightforward thing. What happens if we multiply a diagonal matrix on the left by some other matrix? Well, if you can imagine how this calculation would go, we'd have row 1 getting matched up with column 1, so this first entry would get hit by D1, everything else would be 0, and then row 1 would get matched up with column 2, and so again this first entry in column 2 would get hit by D1, everything else would be 0, and then row 1 would get matched up with column 3, and this first entry in column 3 would again get hit by D1, and so on. What's going to happen is that the subsequent rows of the matrix on the right are going to get multiplied by the subsequent diagonal entries of the matrix on the left. So we see this first row of the matrix on the right just gets hit by D1. And then the second row of the matrix on the right gets hit by D2. Then the third row of the matrix on the right gets hit by D3. When we multiply by a diagonal matrix on the left, the effect is just multiplying the successive rows of the matrix on the right by the successive diagonal entries of the matrix on the left. A similar thing happens if we multiply by a diagonal matrix on the right, but it is slightly different, as you'll see. First, you would get this row matched up with this column, and so the first entry in the first row would get hit by D1. Eventually, we would move on to the second row, which would get matched up with the first column, and the second entry of the first column would get hit by D1. Then, eventually, we would get to the third row, getting matched up with the first column, and we would see that the third entry in the first column gets hit by D1, and so on. In the previous case, we saw successive rows of the matrix get hit by the successive diagonals. But now that we're multiplying by the diagonal matrix on the right, what's going to happen is that successive columns get hit by successive diagonal entries of that diagonal matrix that's on the right. You can see all of these column 1 entries got hit by D1. All the column 2 entries got hit by D2, and so on. That's how easy it is to multiply by diagonal matrices. And I'll leave a link in the description to a video where we do some exercises with more diagonal matrix multiplication. So that's what a diagonal matrix is, as well as some of their nice, interesting, and useful properties. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. If you find my linear algebra videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining as a channel member or pledging on Patreon to get early and exclusive access to certain videos. Or you can make a one-time donation on PayPal. Anything would be a big help. Links in the description. Thanks for watching. Uh, uh, I'm the mathematical menace, the machinations of mankind. Two calculators at the same time, hand signs and abacus, finger count and calculus. I'm the V to the T, my parameter, the rapidest. Happens like this, my lectures, the most prominent, dominant. Call me the Morgan, I get the compliments. The union in together like any time that we intersect, cause my opponents know they need.